Hey everyone, Charles Judd here, and in this video, I'm taking a look at CCIE Blueprint Item 1.4D, OSPF Operations. I've looked at the general operation of OSPF in previous videos for this section, so here we're going to specifically look at a couple of subtopics pointed out by the Blueprint, those being OSPF Graceful Shutdown and GTSM, the Generic TTL Security Mechanism. OSPF Graceful Shutdown is a way we can improve network convergence in cases where we want to remove or shut down an OSPF enabled router. This is the least disruptive way to remove an OSPF router from a network, and that can be done globally on the OSPF process or at an interface level. The advantage here is that instead of waiting for our timers to expire so that the network can reconverge, the graceful shutdown operation will go ahead and notify all of the OSPF neighbors of what's happening so that they can direct network traffic over an alternate path, giving us a faster convergence time. By doing this, if we need to completely shut down or completely remove a router, we already have alternate paths in place and we minimally impact our network. At a global level, when we shut down an entire OSPF process, our router will send hello packets with blank entries for the DR and BDR, and also an empty neighbor list. Remember, we looked at these types of packets in Wireshark in a previous video. By doing this, this is going to trigger the other routers to go back to the init state, trying to reestablish bidirectional communication with neighbors. Also, all of the LSAs originating from this router will be flooded with the age set to 3600 seconds or one hour. This is a way to eventually flush all of those LSAs out of the network. This router will then stop sending and receiving OSPF packets and obviously will then drop all OSPF neighbor adjacencies. If we perform the shutdown at an interface level, we have the same hello packet situation where the hello packet is sent with blank entries for the DR and BDR and an empty neighbor list, again triggering the init state on other OSPF routers. This time though, with the LSAs that are flooded, we're specifically flooding LSAs associated with this specific interface, rather than all LSAs from the router. And of course, we stop sending and receiving OSPF packets and we drop all of those neighbor adjacencies. As we just saw, Graceful Shutdown is really easy to perform, so let's take a look at this. In our topology, you can see that R1 has redundant links going out to R4 at 20.1.1.50. If we say show IP route, we'll see that currently our preferred path is over R2 at 10.1.1.2. So let's go to R2, let's go under our OSPF process, router OSPF1, and let's perform a graceful shutdown. We can do that very simply with the command shutdown. And by the way, I've decreased my hello timer to one second and my hold timer to four seconds just to speed things up here in the lab. So if I say shutdown and hit enter to shut down this entire process, we see a message letting us know that our adjacency is down. If we go back to R1, we're gonna see the same thing. We see that our dead timer has expired and we've dropped a neighbor. If we say show IP OSPF neighbor, we're gonna see that we now only have a neighborship with router three at 3.3.3.3. If we say show IP route, we should see now that we have a route going out to the 20.1.1.0 network over router three at 10.1.1.6. If we go back to R2 and let's say show IP OSPF interface gig zero slash zero, and you can see that even though we've shut down this OSPF process, we still see some information about OSPF here. We see area one, we see our state is down, we see our hello and dead timers that we've configured. So shutting down this process doesn't remove our OSPF configuration. So that's a big advantage to using graceful shutdown rather than just removing the OSPF process completely. If we look at our running configuration, let's say show run pipe to section router OSPF, we will of course see our OSPF configuration still in place. We see that here, a very simple OSPF configuration. If we go back under our OSPF process, router OSPF one, we can quickly bring that back up with a no shut command, just as you would perform on a typical interface. And you can see that our adjacency reforms without having to completely recreate our configuration. If we go back to R1, 
We see that new neighbor listed here in our console. If we again say show IP route, we're gonna see that we're back to using R2 as the next hop at 10.1.1.2. Very simple. We can of course do that under interface configuration mode as well. So if we go to R2 and we go under interface gig zero slash zero, we can say IP OSPF shut down to specifically do that for our interface rather than our entire OSPF process. So graceful shutdown is really simple. You can do that globally or at an interface level with a very simple command. Now let's discuss the generic TTL security mechanism or GTSM. This is outlined in RFC 5082 as a way to protect against remote attacks where spoofing may take place. By default, when OSPF receives an LSA, there is no check made against the TTL value. And by default, we know that OSPF uses a TTL value of one. So if we had a topology as we see here with a couple of OSPF routers, it's possible that an attacker could introduce a spoofed OSPF packet to R2 with a TTL value of two. It would have the spoofed source set to R2's IP address, 172.16.10.2, and the destination set for R1 at 172.16.10.1. R2 would receive the packet, it would decrement the TTL value to one, and send the packet over to R1. Even if R1 happens to reject the packet, we still have traffic hitting the control plane on router one, which can impact the performance if enough of those packets make it over to R1. And that's exactly the issue that GTSM was created to stop. With GTSM, we can enable a TTL security check globally for the entire OSPF process, or we can do that for a specific interface. This forces OSPF to only accept packets with a specific TTL value. And by default, that will be set to 255. The reason for this default value is that 255 is the highest possible TTL value. The TTL value is an 8-bit field, so we can't go higher than 255. And that means if we wanted to spoof OSPF packets with this security mechanism in place, we would need to create a spoofed TTL value of 256 in order to reach another OSPF router, which isn't possible with that 8-bit field. Let's take a look at this in action now. We're using the same topology from before, and this time we're using Wireshark to see those packets more closely. If we go to R2, Let's first enable debugging. Let's say debug IP OSPF adjacencies. Now let's go under router OSPF one and let's enable this security mechanism for our entire OSPF process. We do that by saying TTL all hyphen interfaces. And if we hit enter here, immediately you're going to see a console message stating that we are dropping packets from R1 at 10.1.1.1, which have a TTL value of one. If we jump over to our Wireshark capture, you can see several of our hello packets from the source of 10.1.1.2, which is R2. If we expand that information, we can see our TTL value, our time to live value. You see that listed here, and that is set to 255. If we go to R1, and we enable that here as well. This will bring our adjacency back up, so let's do that. But let's do that at an interface level instead of doing that globally so that we can look at that variation of the command. Let's go under interface gig zero slash zero, which is connecting out to R2, and at the interface level, the command is IP OSPF TTL hyphen security. We wanna see our adjacency reform so that happens, that's good. And if we look at our packet capture, we can see now that we have a source of 10.1.1.2, still with a TTL value of 255, but now also the source from router one is additionally 255. And I am doing a packet capture on the gig zero slash zero interface here, by the way. Now, if we go back over to R1, and I say show IP OSPF neighbor, you're gonna see that we still have two adjacencies. We have an adjacency with R2 and R3. So we haven't affected our adjacency with R3 because we enabled this at the interface level. Now, if I had enabled that globally, 
we would, of course, have to do this on R3 as well. We would have to enable that security mechanism on that router. One additional thing you can do, let's go back to R2, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off all of my debugging. And if we go back under router OSPF1, I'm going to arrow up and again look at the command TTL all hyphen interfaces, and let's look at contextual help. One thing we see here is an optional keyword, which is hops. If we say hops and we look at contextual help again, you'll see that we can configure this within the range of one to 254. Now, this might be a bit deceiving and is a little confusing. This doesn't set the maximum TTL as you think it might. This isn't the actual TTL field value, but rather this is the number of allowed hops. So this is essentially a threshold value. And by default, that's set to zero if we don't specify this optional parameter. Remember, I didn't initially set this parameter. Whatever we configure here is going to be subtracted from 255 to give us the TTL value allowed from OSPF packets. So by default, remember that's set to zero, that gives us 255 minus zero, meaning that only packets with a 255 TTL value would be allowed. If we set that to say 100, then that's going to subtract 100 from 255, and that would leave 155. That means that any OSPF packets within the range of 155 to 255 would be accepted. So if you need to tweak that value for some reason, maybe in the case of something like a discontiguous area from multiple sites that have merged, that's how you can adjust that. One last thing to note is that when we enable this for all interfaces, this does not include virtual links or sham links used with MPLS layer three VPNs. To enable that on a virtual link, you would use the command area virtual hyphen link TTL security. And for sham links, we would do something similar, that being area sham hyphen link TTL hyphen security. So that's a look at some OSPF operations that we had yet to cover under this blueprint item. I hope you found this content useful. And I want to thank you sincerely for watching.